Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Carolina Public Humanities and the General Alumni Association's fifth installation of Lunch with Friends and Strangers. We, uh, we apologize for not having a, an opening loop on, but you know, the technologies are updating and whatnot. So you've, uh, here we are, we are beginning and you have joined us and we're delighted to have you. Um, as you know, this uh, series is uh, designed uh, to look deeply into people that you might be familiar with and a lot of people that you might never have met before and to understand what uh, their lives were like, the struggles they had, um, their accomplishments and their achievements. And we do that with friends, otherwise known as wonderful UNC faculty uh, that we invited. So first, let us invite our friend on, and that is Ashley Anderson. Uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science, Ashley, there you are, and unmute your microphone, and you're, hello, Ashley, how are you holding up? Hi. I'm good, how are you? I'm doing fine. Are you uh, ensconced in your, uh, in your home, where like all of us have been working uh, digitally, uh, diligently from home? Yes, I am in uh, my living room right now, so. And there you go, same with me. My living room has become the Carolina Public Humanities Studio, but it gives us that like a little <laughs> personal touch. But welcome, we're delighted to you've uh, uh, you've joined us. And uh, I should mention that uh, Professor Anderson is an expert on North African politics and, in particular, political organizing. And uh, Ashley has brought a very interesting person for us. And I I just have a feeling many of you will be introduced to this person for the first time. So what I'm going to do is pull up a picture here. Uh, and introduce us to our stranger, who we hope will be a friend by the end of this program. And so, Ashley, why don't you introduce us to this person? In a general sense, who are we talking about? Uh, so we're talking about Habib Ashur, who is um, a really prominent figure in the Tunisian labor movement. Uh, he was Secretary General of uh, the UGTT, which is Tunisia's only, well, now not their only, but Mm -hmm. most prominent um, labor union. He, he was secretary general, I want to say, four times throughout, throughout his lifetime. And um, what were the years of, when was he alive? Oh, he was alive uh, from 1913 to 1999. Okay, wow. And so, you know, I, I, you have an old lion of Tunisian labor. Is there any sort of labor uh, person that people might be familiar with that you could compare uh, Habib Ashur to? It's hard. Um, I would like to say, well, you know, I don't know very much about American labor unions, but he's kind of close to the Samuel Gompers of, of mm -hmm. uh, Tunisian labor. He's not exactly that because um, Farhad Hashad, who I'll mention later on in the pre presentation, who actually uh, mm -hmm. co-founded this Tunisian union with him, is probably more of the Samuel Gompers. Like, everybody liked him, kind of memorialized as a complete and total unblemished hero, mm -hmm. um, whereas Habib Oshur is more of an embattled kind of labor leader, someone that we know kind of moved in the right direction, but might have had some yeah. bad well, we like We like complicated people, and it sounds like he is. He's not, so in, in essence, he's not entirely celebrated only. Yeah. He's got a complicated, but that makes for I, an in, I think the best word to describe him is embattled, which is a word that I always find funny when people describe someone that way, mm -hmm. but I think it actually quite well fits in this, in this circumstance. And of course, I, I hope we get to understand his personality and understand uh, how do these ba battles develop? How many of these battles are from the forces that he's up against? And what are his own actions that maybe, you know, that's why you led yourself down. That's why you're not uh, as respected as you might be, as the other person you had mentioned. Uh, so really very interesting. So let's also now let's situate uh, Abiba Shore a little bit in in place. And uh, I'm sure most of our audience is pretty uh, up to date on their geography. But we are talking about this place, right? Tunisia. Yeah. So we're talking about Tunisia, which, as you can kind of tell from the map, uh, sits between Algeria and Libya um, on the Mediterranean kind of sea and the coast. Uh, so this is North Africa that we're talking about. It, I wouldn't say it's a hop, skip, and a jump from, from Sicily, but it is, you know, I've, I've been on that boat ride. It's about a 10-hour boat ride uh, back and forth. Yeah. So it, it's in a space that we kind of all know about. And the places that we're going to talk about uh, during this talk is this island off the coast of Sfax. I'm sure I was trying, excuse me, I was trying to zoom it up. This is the wonderful amateurness of Zoom here. <laughs> but I was trying to zoom in a little bit on us on this here. Yeah, so this, this island called Kirkenna is, um, is where he's from. 
Uh, most of his militancy uh, occurred in two different places, in Sfax, so that's the, the union that he led for a very long time before he actually became um, the head of the UGTT itself. And then the rest of the activism typically happened in T Tunis, which is yeah, the capital yeah, um, of Tunisia, which is more in the, yeah, in the north of, of Tunisia. So those are the three main places that we'll be, we'll be discussing during this period. And give, give the audience a little sense of Tunisia's general history. I mean, I'm sure many people know that it was French protectorate, but it's part of the French colonial empire. Uh, can you sort of set up uh, where he was born into and how, uh, what Tunisia was like? Um, so, like I said, he was born in 1913. At that point, Tunisia had been a protectorate for uh, some 30, 40 years mm -hmm. almost. Um, uh, and it's important to know that a protectorate isn't a colony in, yep. in the strictest sense. Um, and so when we think of a colony, we think, well, we need to think of two different things, right? Settler colonies and more extractive colonies. Um, and Algeria, which is the kind of most proximate comparison point, was a settler colony, right? There are a lot of French natives who lived there. Um, Algerians enjoyed some like dual status. Uh, that wasn't the case in Tunisia, right? Um, so there, there was French, Italian, et cetera, settler colony, or well, not colonialism, but there was settlement, right? Mm -hmm. So there were French people who were working there. To, there were European workers. Uh, but there wasn't as large of a population, so they were highly outnumbered by the number of like native Tunisians that were there. Um, and so he, he was born into a world in which there there's um, kind of a majority minority divide, right? Where most mm -hmm. people living in Tunisia are uh, native Tunisians, um, but most of the benefits that are given to people in terms of you know you know. Be, being in positions of power in the government mm -hmm. and even positions of power in the in the working world were given to Europeans. So um, there was a there was a practice uh, which was called the colonial third, which meant that um, all p people of European descent at, at, by like statute had to make at least one third more than anybody who was of indigenous heritage. So. These are, these are the types of things that he was born yeah. into and, and eventually had to contend against um, throughout his, his career as a unionist. Yeah. As, as I know a fair amount about Algeria and about French colonialism in general, but it is true that one of the blind spots for me is the protectorate. And just as a uh, curiosity, were, were people under Tunisia under the Code de l'Indigenat, which was the incredibly repressive code against indigenous peoples that was enforced in Algeria and enforced in Sub-Saharan Africa and enforced in Indochina. Was that in practice also in Tunisia as well? There were definitely, um, I would say, separations between, there, there was no real move for um, integration of Tunisian bodies into, you know, ruling, there was no like, dual rule or anything like that mm -hmm. and so there definitely was discriminatory policy against um, indigenous people to the extent that um, one thing that I will say to the extent and I think in a protectorate there was more effort to work with um, the local ruling class mm -hmm. so there was a big effort to co-opt like the Bay of Tunisia um, which which is loosely I guess what you would call a king of Tunisia yeah. at the time so there was there was um, an attempt to co-opt that, that uh, kind of whatever the ruling structure was, yeah. it was more to co-opt it rather than to eliminate it wholesale. Yeah, we saw that sort of associationist rule that you can uh, make some sort of allegiance with local elites and local power structures and kind of work through that. Yeah. Um, well, let's get let's get to uh, let's get a little bit back to Habib Ashour and look a little bit at his life. And uh, you you mentioned that he was born on an island. I want to say this does not look too shabby of a place to be born. It looks in, uh, a nice fishing village. Where where are we here? We're on the island of Kirkenna. Yeah, we're on the island of Kirkenna, which is known for only two things: agriculture, which primarily was uh, considered women's work, and then mm -hmm. fishing, which was dominated by men. Um, and Habib Ashour actually like. So of, of the people, he wasn't uh, one of the elite families. The Ashur family did not have, you know, wasn't one of the elite class in Tunisia. It, it's kind of a quirky thing. In Tunisia, it's like, if you have a certain last name, we, we all know that you are one of the like very high families mm -hmm. that had a lot of money. He wasn't one of those. 
but he was actually better off than most of the people in in Kirkenna. His his father was a fisherman. They had enough money in a in a book that's written about him. Uh, one of the exceptional things about him is that they had enough money to continually buy him shoes throughout the year. So mo even even yeah. during the summer when he wasn't going to school. So most families did not have you know during the summer you didn't get new shoes. Yeah. Um, and so he, he is known for being able to have those. Um, he, had, he had a number of siblings, so it was, he wasn't like an only child that could afford these privileges. So the family was somewhat well off. And uh, he, he also attended one of the um, kind of European-based schools mm -hmm. that had been set up in Kirkenna. So learning um, French language, uh, learning. Yeah. He, he was never good at it. He never, so this is a comment that people made. He never quite took to French, uh, never quite loved to use the language, although his autobiography was written in the French language, so. Mm -hmm. So he attends school. Um, he's from, a, you could say he's not from, uh, circumstances are not dire, but he's not wealthy, but he comes from a, a, a good, stable family, um, mm -hmm. siblings, go attend school. Uh, when does he leave Kirkenna and how much does Kirkenna remain part of his life? Um, so he leaves Kirkenna uh, to go to vocational school in Tunis. Oh, when does, when does this happen? Uh, I think in the 1920s. I think Probably it was like when he was like, maybe. Yeah, I, I'm not exact. Yeah, about 15 or so he yeah. leaves to go to Tunis. Um, one thing that I do want to mention about his youth in Kirkenna that, that is a new fact that I learned actually just this morning. Um, so Farhad Heshad, this other unionist mm -hmm. that is quite prominent, um, who actually founded the, the, the UGTT, this union, with him, um, I, di I didn't know that they knew each other beforehand. I knew that they were both from Kirkenna, but I didn't quite know that they, were, they had known each other outside of the context of unionism. They were actually school, school grade, like elementary school friends. Wow. Um, so they had known e they've known each other you know, their entire lives, more or less. Um, so I thought that was a very interesting fact. Is it fair uh, to say they're the two giants of Tunisian labor come from one place? That is really remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not just that, an island that's not even on the mainland, where I'm sure more economic activity is happening on the mainland than it's happening on the island of Kirkenna. Yeah. That's a good, don't you love history where you scrape those things open? You're like, oh, wait, there they are. <laughs> that, that's my favorite thing about um, this what the work that I've done, right? Labor sounds pretty boring, but <laughs> if you if you dig into the stories, like you'll find little quirks like this, but I'll talk about this a little bit. You'll find like these really intriguing like death plots and assassination attempts and like all of these yeah. really cool things that it's like watching a soap opera. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it's really fascinating. So he, he uh, you know, when does it, we have from the late twenties, he's at vocational school. Um, mm -hmm. This is a period of incredible, anti-colonial messaging going around internationally. I'm just, and I assume in Tunisia, um, there, um, uh, for example, Messali Hajj forms the Etoile uh, Nord Africaine, the ENA, uh, the, and uh, which is supposedly to bring in anybody from North Africa who's in France to be part of a union. So, and, and it's very, you know, lots of uh, publication of materials. Is he immersed as a school age person in a culture in which he's reading these sorts of things? Do we have a sense of what what he's exposed to in his education and while he's in Tunis? Um, so in Tunis, I would probably say no, more more likely than yes. Um, the, the thing about him is that he was never considered an intellectual, right? He mm -hmm. was he was not an intellectual worker and in you know in the 1940s and 50s in Tunisia we see the working class divide among manual laborers and intellectual workers and he is definitely for the manual laborers and that like to go back to the question that you asked me about how Kirkenna influenced his um, kind of politics or his his outlook on life I think that's it that he was he was from a manual labor town and he remained very aligned with people who work with their hands, people who are not terribly intellectual. Um, so I, I don't think he was aware at that point of, you know, all of the kind of grander things that were going yeah. on in the world. He, you know, he went to school to become a, an electrician. And that's, that's kind of yeah, what Okay, he, that's what really interesting. Did. So, um, go ahead, I will please. Say that four years prior to him uh, moving to Tunis, there was the first attempt at creating an indigenous labor union. 
Um, it failed remarkably, um, but I think that, you know, it's interesting that those things sync up. He was like just off the, he was 11 when this happened, so he couldn't have been too cognizant of it. But, you know, mm-hmm. had, it, had it happened, I think, during the time when he was in Tunis, it, it might have been a different story. Very interesting. You know, um, do, does he, do we have any idea of his life um, during World War II? Obviously, Tunisia was a site of conflict in World War II. Any sense of what he was doing during this period? I assume he might have been too old to be serving. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I don't think he was ever in the, the military service. Um, I think at that point, he was actually, well, it, it's unclear if this happened during the war, but around the kind of wartime period, is when we saw a greater effort to integrate uh, native Tunisians into um, the CGT, which is the, the French labor union. Mm-hmm. The giant uh, French labor, yeah. Um, um, to integrate them as a way of kind of stopping them from being too aligned with anti-colonialism. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he did actually, he, he uh, won a position at the local regional union in Saxe, um, so he, he start, at that point, he's, he's becoming more ingrained into, you know, union institutions and union activism through his work with the CGT. And then, of course, I, I think we might be ready to say that this kind of activity gets you into trouble every once in a while. Uh, yeah. Tell us about this picture. I think everyone would recognize what we might call a mugshot. Uh, and uh, so his activities got him in some trouble. And when was this? I think this is in the 40s. Yeah, so this is actually a, a picture that's taken in 1947. And this is um, kind of after he began to realize the, the vast inequalities that existed between French and uh, Tunisian workers. So this is after he actually broke away from the French CGT to found um, a completely native indigenous Tunisian union, the UGTT. Mm-hmm. Um, so that happens in 1946 that he and Farhat Hashed, his, you know, elementary school classmate, um, work together to unite separate unions in Tunis and Sfax. They put those together and they create this UGTT that grows like exponentially over the next couple of years. And so in, in 1947, um, the UGTT organizes a series of strikes to protest against, among other things, um, the unequal pay between Mm -hmm. European workers and native Tunisian workers, Um, the fact that um, several employers were unwilling to grant Muslims um, holidays off for for, like Muslim holidays, Uh, working hours were different, all sorts of things were like just labor inequalities between these two groups. They hold this huge, series of protests throughout um, the month of April and May in SPACs that culminate in this big protest in August that is brutally repressed by French forces. 29 people die. He gets shot. Um, Apparently the bullet almost missed his heart. I think that's more probably emphasis, you know, like legend. Good story, you know, Ashley, don't let it get in the way of a good story. Yeah, but, um, but, you know, he goes to jail, and this is kind of the moment of his political awakening, that this isn't just a labor issue, this Mm -hmm. is a political issue, and we have to integrate uh, our kind of labor struggle into the, to the anti-colonial struggle, into the national struggle. Which is a really, and this is a really interesting point, um, being somewhat a student of colonialism and French colonialism, you know, uh, we had mentioned at the beginning that there was a massive railroad strike in 1947, the Bamako railroad strike, from which uh, Usman Sambeni's wonderful novel, God's Bits of Wood, uh, was written about. Um, but what's really interesting, and I think we're getting at here, um, is the, the tying together of a labor movement and a colonial movement. And sometimes we have to pull those things apart and say, what is the search for political power and political independence uh, is often not enough that we're also talking about labor and labor rights and equal, like you said, equal pay, respect, and that these things get mixed together. And he, it sounds like himself, began to see his labor movement as tied to a larger political movement as well as what you're saying. Yeah. And at this point, I think from, from since it happened so almost contemporaneous with the creation of the UGTT, right? Mm-hmm. So the UGTT is created in 1946 and all of these strikes that lead to repression you know, happen in the following year, um, it is impossible, I would say, and I think any Tunisian would say, it is impossible to, to look at the labor struggle without looking at the national struggle. They are so fundamentally int- intertwined that you yeah. can't 
there, this extraction isn't, isn't um, really possible. Just out of curiosity, I mean, one of the things I know from Algeria, one of the big um, transformations that colonialism had, in, had uh, uh, enacted upon the society was the really transforming people into wage laborers, that you've taken an entire uh, ag agriculture, which might be based on land sharing, transhumans, uh, all sorts of other practices before colonialism sets in, and you've essentially turned into agribusiness and you've turned... Uh, people who had sus sustenance or subsistence agricultural means or other means of, of sucker, you turn them into wage laborers. Is that also the sort of the process that's going on in Tunisia? Yeah, I mean, it happened a lot earlier. So yeah, it sure. happened you know, in the 1800s, kind mm -hmm. of going into the 1900s. But there was, it, it wasn't just that there was subsistence agriculture, there were people doing things like, you know, there were artisans. And yeah. I mean, if you've ever visited, um, a city in North Africa, I'm sure you've been to the, the, the uh, Medina, mm -hmm. and that's what it looked like. I mean, look, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't see Reeboks and Nikes that people were selling in their yeah. small artisan shops, but, you know, people were just selling things like that, and then there were agriculturalists, and that was about it. And then when you bring in agribusiness, or you bring in, like, you know, a railway, and thing, you, all of this infrastructure creates wage labor, and that's, that's how you saw these things come up in Tunisia. So let's let's get to the period of independence. What is uh, um, for those that don't know about Tunisia? Tunisia not being a colony and protected, we've already discussed. Uh, Tunisia gets its independence earlier than a lot of African colonies, uh, French African colonies uh, in in Africa. Most of them in 1960, Algeria in 1962, but Morocco and Tunisia get their independence in 1956 after some troubles. It wasn't a totally peaceful. Where was he and how was he involved and how was labor involved in those years, sort of 1952 to 56, 57? Uh, they're pretty directly involved um, into, into, like I said, it's, it's impossible to extract these two uh, battles from one another. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1952, I believe, yeah, in 1952, uh, Farhad Hashed, who is the leader of... Um, well, even before that, though, um, the, the Tunisian labor movement begins to integrate with the major anti-colonial or nationalist party, the, the Neo-Destor. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a strategic move on the part of the Neo-Destor. They saw this union, which I, which I mentioned, grew exponentially, yeah, like sure. from you know, 30,000 members to almost 500,000 within a period of years. And so they saw this um, very organized group of people and said, oh my gosh, if we could get these people on our side, like then we'll, we'll have, you know, bigger numbers in the streets, blah, 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 we can mobilize a lot better. So the neo Destor moved specifically to align with the, the labor union and to infiltrate the labor union. And there were natural connections between the two. So um, when the neo Destor has to go underground because they're being persecuted by the French government, the labor union pops up and right, do, does does their militancy for them through mm -hmm. the guise of strikes. So they have these strikes, which are around labor issues, but definitely treat, you know, political issues as well. And the French government takes note of that. And they um, actually do assassin end up assassinating Farhad Hashed in, in 1952. Activism continues through the labor union. And then we eventually get independence. Um, it, well, through the labor union and the party, and we eventually get independence in 1956. Yes. Um, and so I think at, at the point of independence, there's a real reckoning between the party and the union who are these two pillars of how we, you know, how we got our independence. Mm -hmm. And they have to figure out, well, who's going to, who's going to rule, right? Who has, who's actually been pulling the strings here? Who has the power to control what government looks like afterwards? And that's when the real troubles start between the government of Tunisia yeah. and the labor union who who end up having like a frenemies relationship from that point on. Regardless, I mean, you know, the, the goals of, of government and politics are different than the goals of unions. And so even if they become, become allies, especially uh, when the allies now has a position where the political power is in charge now or, or is, is at the top, now suddenly they realize, oh, we actually have different goals or different priorities and values uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what we're going to focus on. Um, all too well, often, and I think that's, Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I would say all too often <laughs> in post-colonial regimes, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but once the political power is established, 
we can have a, a real neglect of some of the other demands that were that were part of parcel of the mixture of labor and politics that go in together. Do you feel that uh, the politicians let down the unionist, or was it just a tenuous relationship? It wasn't just tenuous. It was it was like outright hostility at, at different points in time, and it was uh, I would think I would say a betrayal from from the beginning. Okay. Right. Um, so it, when you when you say that politicians and unionists have different goals, I think that is exacerbated under conditions of underdevelopment, right? Or late development is what we like mm -hmm. to call it now. Um, so once Tunisia got its independence, keep in mind that this is happening during the 1950s, you know, close to the 1960s, when when the, the kind of global move is either, you have two choices. You're gonna fully integrate yourself into global capitalism and try to survive, or you're going to try to build uh, via a more socialist model, which is like we, we try to build our own industry kind of separate using the money, obviously, that we can get from from global capitalism, but kind of separate from that and build up our industries and try to win that way. Yeah. And this the is a thing that's in Latin America. Yeah, ISI, things that are happening in Latin America and, and Southeast Asia. And so for a while, for a year, um, uh, Borghiba decides to go this global capitalist route, which seems like a complete betrayal to labor because, you know, yeah. labor, in the, at least in the short term, is going to benefit from ISI, right? A lot yeah. of, you're, you know, you're building up industry, you're going to need to hire yeah. a lot of workers, etc. So that was the first betrayal. But then he decides, oh, this isn't really working. Let's, let's switch and actually appease our labor constituents by doing ISI. But what the ISI that he, uh, that Habib Bourguiba, which is the president of Tunisia at the time, mm -hmm. advocates is very much, uh, okay, you accept lower wages. Like workers have to take some sacrifice for the greater good of the country. Just like they sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the country during the independence yeah. period, we're gonna have to do that a little bit more now. And so workers didn't get, you know, there were no wage yeah. increases even during periods of inflation. And so all this led to more strikes, more tension. It was, it was kind of a mess. And, and yet, I'm just going to pull up this picture, and yet, as you mentioned, uh, Abiba Shore is a, is a complicated person, and, and it also sounds like a savvy person. Uh, so here we have him with power. And uh, explain to our viewers what we're looking at here. Here's a much older Achor and a very prominent, important person that you should introduce us to. Yeah. So this on the, I guess, hopefully what is your left is, um, yeah. is Habib Hab Bourguiba, who was the president of Tunisia from its independence 1956 until 1987, when his health conditions kind of mm. led him to be replaced in a bloodless coup. Um, but these two people are cl your classic frenemies. Um, I mentioned previously that Hubi Bashur had been Secretary General of the Union four times in its history, mm -hmm. and that is because he was, um, uh, let's see, both brought to prominence and cast out by Habib Bourguiba. And this is like, this is just kind of what he did. He was very good as, as president of Tunisia about uh, what he would say, uh, kind of destroying people and then rehabilitating them at, at his whim in order to keep them kind of on their toes and to make sure that nobody got enough power to oppose him. So and he, so... He did jail time. Ahead. He did jail time, as you yeah. were saying. He did. He did jail time twice. Um, yeah, no, possibly three times. I'm trying to think of all of the times that he was... He's in jail. So one of the, during the, I would say the 1960s, they actually had a somewhat positive relationship. And the reason was, the reason why that was the case is because, again, Habib Ashur uh, formed this, this union with uh, Farhad Hashed and expected to be the, the you know, the, the obvious candidate for secretary general after Farhad Hashed was assassinated. He was passed over for a much more intellectual worker, um, Ahmed Ben Salah, and so that kind of started to lead to tensions within the union and brought him closer to the government at a time when the union was oppositional to the government. <laughs> um, and so he, he's actually encouraged by Habib Bourguiba to form a splinter union that, does not, that kind of like opposes intellectual workers. He forms that union and then Habib Bourguiba says, oh, this is bad. 
this is not a good, you know, like publicly, even though he encourages us publicly, he yeah. says, why would anyone want to tarnish, you know, the sanctity of our, our one Tunisian union? We got to bring these people back together. Oh, so he brings them back together under the condition that neither Ashur nor, uh, nor this uh, Ahmed bin Salah can run the union. It's got to be somebody who's from the party. So that, that was like a whole mess in the 1960s. Wow. Um, and then he is, uh, he is um, involved in a scandal because he eventually does become um, secretary general in the late 1960s. But this is, again, a period where so this ISI model is failing. Workers are not willing to accept any further sacrifices. So once Ashur approves a number of strikes in the late 1960s, Borgiba is like, oh, this is bad. We can't, we can't have this. So there is a scandal about a boat that blows up, like literally just explodes uh -huh. um, off the coast of Tunisia. And he's somehow implicated in this scandal, like his negligence. Like the, the, basically the, the accusation is that he blew up the boat in order to get the insurance money. So they place him in jail for insurance fraud. Oh, um, nice. And he's in jail for, so I think he's um, sentenced to about 10 years hard labor, but then gets pardoned. Um, rehabilitated as a union leader in the 1970s um, and is kind of stays in power from 1973 to 1978 mm -hmm. um, and has you know kind of it, it's interesting because during that period there are two assassination attempts on him uh, apparently like allegedly wow. organized by Habibur to like replace him as he becomes more militant, right? As he approves more strikes and things like this. What a remarkable picture then to look at with that story that you just told us, you know, it's just that, yeah. you know, how long can these two trust each other? Um, or, or can, you know, Ashur at least trust Borgiba who has considerably more power. Um, but Borgiba yeah. sees the power that Ashur has and keeps pulling him back in. It seems, I mean, I'm looking at Borgiba. He's like, I, I can use this man. And the two of them are looking at each other kind of in the same way. A really fascinating picture. But he's, I, go ahead. Even through all, all of this like craziness, right? Ashur still commands a lot of respect among especially manual laborers, the, those, those uh, people within the union. And the union is still quite large. Um, so it's still, you know, at least 200,000 members, if not, if not more than that, you know, the number fluctuates over time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it is always to Borghiba's benefit to, to try and find an ally that can, can uh, suppress strikes, you know, keep lit workers happy, uh, but is still working in service of the government. The problem is that Habib Ashur, you know, has his own kind of games in mind and what he is trying to achieve both on the side of labor, right? He does, I think he is a man who very much cared about, you know, getting rights for workers, supporting workers, uh, making sure that they uh, shared in the, the kind of largesse of the government mm -hmm. and, you know, economic growth. Uh, but he also was a person who wanted, you know, power himself, right? Yeah. And so when he could use his own base, possibly against the government, he would do so. Yeah, very fascinating person. Uh, I want we are we're coming up pretty close to the end of our time, but we want to make sure we understand what happens with uh, with Ashore. This is a picture of Ashore later in life, um, and uh, his uh, as you mentioned, Borghiba is out by 1987. Is followed by another dictator, uh, Ben Ali. What's his later life like after Borghiba, and what are we looking at in this picture? So. Um... After Borghi, so like I said, in 1978, he again goes back to jail. There's a, there's a huge strike in Tunisia, a big general strike. Um, uh, 110 union leaders are, are placed in jail, whatever. So that, that was another period where he's on the outs. But then they rehabilitate him again. So in 1981, they decide, oh, we really need the union to, to come back to prominence. Um, so they, they hold a special Congress for the union. And at that time, Habib Ashur is under house arrest. So he's not eligible to run for, for any office in this, in this union. But the unionists who are participating in this Congress say, we're not going to hold it without Habib Ashur. If he can't have a position, we're not going to do this. Um, and so they create a separate position for him, president. Um, not, and this is a lot, like outside of the secretary general position. Mm -hmm. And so he is then president in 1981, um, becomes secretary general again in 1982, and then like 
is effectively retired by the government from union activism in 1984. Okay. Um, so by the, by the time we get to Ben Ali, he is no longer you know a union activist. He cannot participate in the UGT elections. He can't hold any offices, um, but he's still very much a respected figure, right? People cannot deny um, the contributions that he's made. Um, his kind of Again, he wasn't always on the side of the workers. Sometimes he was on the side of the government, but he's, he's one of those people that always kind of came to the side of right eventually. Okay. And so um, I think, you know, he, in, even in the, the writings that people do about him past that 1984 period, he was, he was very much in consultation with people who did lead the union um, and always kind of fighting for workers, even outside of that context. And do you know when this picture in particular was taken? Is this from his... This, he mean, seems a fairly older man here. I would imagine just from the haircut of this guy in the, <laughs> in the kind of afros um, that it is probably in the early 1980s. Okay. Um, definitely an older man by that point. Because, you know, by the 1980s, he's what, like 1984, he's 71. Yeah, okay. He's an older man at that point. But, yeah, I, the only time I've seen afros like this um, on, on Tunisian people is like the 70s, 80s. Well, good, good targeting of the dating of that. Well, we are coming uh, close to the end of our, our session here. I want to invite anyone who has questions to, to go ahead and leave questions in the question and answer section. But I would like to think a little bit of the legacy of, of Ashur. Um, and Ashley, I know that you've done a fair amount of work on the Arab Spring and looking at uh, political organization in the Arab Spring. And one of the things that, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one of the things that I understand that, that has been informative to me is that we can't just look at the Arab Spring as being a Twitter revolution or a Facebook revolution, that it starts in Tunisia and Tunisia has a long history of organizing. So what is the relationship between, say, uh, Ashur's legacy of political organization and what we saw in the Arab Spring? I think the major thing, the, the like biggest legacy that Ashur has had on um, both Tunisian politics and Tunisian labor, is that he's very adamant about uh, about creating a separation between the government and between the labor union. Um, there was a big battle uh, in the post-independence period of whether the the labor union should create a party of itself. And, uh, and try to integrate itself very much into parliament, whether it should align itself holistically with the neo destour and integrate itself into parliament, or whether it should just be a separate entity that's kind of autonomous and, you know, works on labor issues, maybe has some, influ you know, lets its members vote the way it votes, but, you know, is not really in the political game. Um, and Ashur was one who said, look, we need to be separate. We need to be a separate thing. In, 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 you know, integrating ourselves too highly with politics is going to be problematic. It's going to allow them to swallow us. And I think that separation was what allowed the UGTT in 2011 to be a big force against the government and to like mobilize itself separate from the government and in opposition to the government without those kind of tricky ties, right? That is the reason why at lower levels of the union, you had people who were willing to speak up and say, hey, this isn't right. We're going to organize strikes against this. We're going to, we're going to side with the protesters instead of siding with the government. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. I have, um, thank you, Ashley. This has been absolutely fantastic. I have uh, two questions on deck. One is about, from Jacob, about um, neoliberalism um, and whether there was a change in the um, approach to economics with the restructuring of the IMF and, uh, you know, or World Bank loans and the sort of austerity programs. Um, and in the 1990s, a real shift towards a neoliberal global capitalist uh, framework. Did that have any bearing on the way that labor reacted in Tunisia? Were there shifts in the 90s in the uh, Tunisian economy as well? Uh, there were shifts in the 90s, but the shifts actually happened a lot before that. So the, like I said, the ISI experiment completely failed. By the 1960s, like everything that they had tried in the socialist model um, had not worked. So they decided to open up again to global capital um, kind of on their own through this process that they called infita, which is just Arab, Arabic for opening. Um, and so that is when we saw a different type of problem emerge between the government and labor that, you know, 
the government was now making all of this money and none of it was getting funneled back to labor. And so we saw that big strike that happens in 1978 is in part because of the, the inability of the government or the uh, unwillingness of the government to share the wealth where you see cap they're clearly aligning with capital mm -hmm. in tunisia right fostering capital making sure to fund money to develop capital and not towards labor um and then also because of different things like these assassination attempts that are, that are happening yeah. in the um so that happens like it starts in the 1970s culminates again in the 1980s when we have, you know, loan packages are actually starting to be given by the IMF to Tunisia. But the, the contingency of those loan packages is you yeah. have to raise prices, right? You can't, you can't be giving consumer subsidies anymore. Yeah. And so one of the biggest protests that happened um, in 1984, which is why Ashur ends up having to leave the union again, is um, these bread riots that happened in 1984. The price of bread was going to be increased by like 50%. Ashur says, this is not a good idea. Please don't do this. Like, this is going to cause rioting in the streets. Burgiba does it anyway. There's rioting in the streets. Yeah. And it's a, it's a whole problem. So my this all happened. My understanding is in 2011, the prices, food prices were considerably high as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a really fascinating story here. I, I do have to, we have to call it very soon here. In fact, we have time for one more question. It's a very detailed question from our friend Jonathan Gerard about um, Jewish participation. I imagine that after the founding of the State of Israel, there were maybe fewer Jews in Tunisia than there were at the beginning, but were there Jewish uh, laborers involved at all in any of uh, Abiba Shor's actions before World War II or even after? So I wouldn't know the specific identity of workers, um, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, there obviously was a, a fairly large Jewish community yeah, yeah. Um, in Tunisia, because I, I just know this from the fact that there are a number of synagogues that are yeah. still existing in Tunisia. Um, but I, I do think that it is worth emphasizing the transnational connections between Tunisian labor and American labor. So, um, in fact, when I mentioned that Habib Ashur was, was um, not available to be voted on for the, you know, he, he, he didn't succeed uh, Farhad Hashad in part because he was away in the United States getting training about how to, um, how to best advocate for Tunisian nationalism on the international labor front. That's fascinating. Um, so there were uh, critical connections between the two, um, the, you know, Tunisia or the UGTT was a member of um, not the WFTU but the other one. I cannot remember that. The maybe ITWU. Okay. What, what is now the I, ITCFU? I can't okay. remember what the old name used to be. We'll get all our acronyms <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, so the, there there were clear connections both in training, um, in advocacy and even financial connections between these two labor groups. Well, this is just fascinating. Um, we have been introduced to a person. Um, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that 99% of the people who are watching this have never heard of Habib Ashur, and now we have been introduced to a really fascinating person, a complicated person um, uh, who uh, did important work and lived uh, in, in interesting times. And Ashley, we are living in interesting times as well. On, uh, and I hope that uh, you are able to find uh, uh, joy this summer in, in really, uh, really difficult circumstances. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us, Ashley, uh, and introducing us to Abiba Shore. I want to thank all of you for joining us for friends, uh, uh, Lunch with Friends and Strangers. We have one more on the docket. That's Friday. Uh, someone who might be a little more known than Abiba Shore, Michael Jordan, will be the topic on Friday. Another complicated figure. So... Uh, we'll be doing that with Matt Andrews. I want to thank Carolina Meadows uh, Retirement Community in uh, Chapel Hill for their wonderful support of our programs, the Cotton Merca Group at Morgan Stanley for their wonderful support, especially of our K through 12 programs, and of course our partner on this program and all programs uh, this summer for our online projects, uh, the General Alumni Association. So thank you to Catherine Nichols at the GAA, and of course Paul Benici, who keeps the uh, the ship running here uh, behind the scenes. He's the blank Carolina Public Humanities on your screen now and then. Ashley, thank you so much. I do hope that we get to work together in 3D next time, not just 2D, um, but uh, have a wonderful day and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. This is great. Great. All right, everybody, have a good afternoon. We'll see you on Friday. Bye-bye now.